Uh, welcome back everybody to Python for Physics. Uh, this is week four of our course. It's also week four of Regis, which means that we're roughly halfway there uh, for the whole program. And so today we're gonna do, actually, um, before we start, I usually like to start by asking the class how they're doing, trying to engage, uh, see, you know, try to get your feedback. And so why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you tell us how you're doing? Just write in the, uh, in the Q question and answers uh, bit of your video stream. Just tell us how you're doing wherever you are in the world. Um, yeah, we just wanna hear from you. So hopefully you're doing well, hopefully you're staying healthy. Uh, hopefully you're enjoying this class as well as Regis. Um, we're very much enjoying having you here and engaging with you. Um, and so this has been quite a pleasure. So let, let me uh, start the fourth week uh, by first talking about some administrative stuff as always. Um, there's always new people joining us to each one of your session, to each one of these sessions. Um, if you're new to Python for Physics, welcome. Uh, you might feel that some of us that we'll talk about today um, might be new to you and perhaps you haven't gotten the, the appropriate background to learn about it. That's actually not going to be the case for a big portion of today's uh, class. So the, the new material that I'll introduce uh, largely doesn't build on previous stuff. But nevertheless, you can go back and watch the previous videos and I would encourage you to do that. Uh, and so to catch you up, what you can do is just send us an email to pythonforphysics at edu.edu and automatically you'll get a reply. You get an automatic reply uh, from us. And what it looks like is it's basically just a, a string of text with different links. And so if you go to uh, the first link, that will take you to our web page. That will take you to Python for Physics, the, the Python for Physics uh, web page for 2020. And there we're answering many of your questions that are coming along. We also have a lot of information to uh, catch you up. Also, you will get a link to our Slack chat. Slack is a program where we can, we can talk to each other uh, and talk about physics and programming and whatever other questions you may have. Uh, there is one caveat that it is uh, it, it's for people that are 16 years or older. Uh, you've made it to our live stream, so you perhaps don't need this, stream, this link. Uh, or perhaps you're watching one of the recorded videos, in which case, if you want to see the live streams, this is a link. Um, the recordings are going to be available at, at, at or our uh, Regis page from the ODU's that edu slash regis page. If you go to a recordings tab, this link will take you directly there. There you would find a bunch of different tabs and a bunch of videos, including Python for Physics, or more directly, you can just uh, access the archive of videos here. Finally, we have a Dropbox that, where we share all these slides as well as, um, as, well as our code uh, and di different input files to the code. Uh, and you can find that Dropbox uh, using this link, okay? Here's what our page looks like. Uh, and so go visit it. If you have any questions, some of these questions might have been already addressed there. Finally, we've created a Dropbox folder for some of you to share your code. And so to get access to that, what you need to do is email us with the subject line Dropbox access. This is a, a separate Dropbox folder than the one that I shared with you before. Uh, and so this, I need your emails to give you access to it. There's been some questions as to what is the purpose of this. Some people have uh, gotten access to it and made a folder with your name, which is wonderful. And that's exactly what you should do. You should write your first name, underscore your last name. There's many different folders already there existing. So you can see an example of it. The purpose of that is for you to share your code. So if you want to send us your code and so we can uh, debug it, find the errors and try to fix it and give you a, a better idea of where you might be going. That's exactly the purpose for this. Also, you can show us your output. You can show us your figures. And so if your code, if you're using Jupyter and it's not easy for you to, for example, and it's not easy for you to show us your code uh, using this folder, what you can do is just show us the figures that are coming out. And so we can visualize it and, and try to see if your results are making sense or not. And so what you should do is make use of this and send us messages in Slack or via email when your results are ready. And so we can take a look at it and give you feedback. Um, the last administrative thing that I want to highlight 
is that we're going to have a trivia night this week. Uh, this is part of the Regis program, and it's going to be on Thursday afternoon. Uh, for details, I would encourage you to go to the ODU that the odu.edu slash regis page and look at the schedule there. Um, and this is going to be hosted by Andrew Dodson, who is a, a physics uh, alumnus from Old, Old Dominion. Uh, he's actually, he's right now a PhD student in New Mexico State University. Uh, and he's going to be, if you don't know him, what I would do, what I would encourage you to do is look up Andrew Dodson at you in YouTube and you will see a bunch of fun videos that he makes where he tries to make physics uh, and academia accessible to everybody. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And so he's going to be hosting this trivia night and the trivia night is going to be on material that we've covered in Regis so far. Uh, so if you want to study up and participate and try to be engaged, go back and look at all the videos that we've that we've covered so far. Um, and if you want to participate in the live session, you have to go to this link. So try to copy it down, take a screenshot, whatever you may need to do um, and uh, and send and fill out the survey that go that takes you there um if you don't are not able to use this link for some reason if you don't don't copy it correctly what you can do is just send an email to regis at odu edu and uh asking for access to the survey and you should have received a, a, a copy of the survey already so fill this out and what this do, does is that it creates a lottery where we're going to have a select few of you participate live with andrew dotson in the in the trivia night for the rest of you that don't make it to the lottery, you're going to be able to still see the videos live on the stream as well as the recorded ones afterwards. So go ahead and fill out the survey. Uh, I would encourage you. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Andrew is, is just a great guy. and He's a lot of fun. So uh, please participate. Okay, so that's, that's it for uh, administrative details. What I figured we would do today, since we have covered quite a bit of material so far, and we have a lot of questions from you, is that we would do a mini review first to address the stuff that we've seen so far. Uh, and this is going to be supplemented. It is not going to be just by me, uh, but it, this is going to be partly uh, done with some of the other team members in the Python for Physics group. Uh, and so first, we're going to hear a um, we're going to hear from Professor Ted Rogers, who's going to tell us how he generated this uh, animation uh for the the project that he assigned to you guys which was the first project on projectile motion so what we're going to do is we're gonna, i'm gonna i'm gonna let ted take over and he's gonna tell us all about this so what i'll do ted is that i'll stop sharing the screen and you can start sharing yours does that work yeah all right and i'm also going to mute myself so that to avoid feedback Okay, um, oh. is my screen showing? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can see it. Okay, good. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so glad to be back. Hello to everybody. Um, I just wanted to give some updates um, for those of you who are still interested in refining these projects, these introductory projects that I suggested. Um, I refined my own, so I had a pretty crude um, Jupyter Notebook that I showed everybody when I was describing this. And I tried to make it a little bit more interesting. So we had achieved the basic goal of drawing an arc representing the path of a projectile that was supposed to hit a monster in a video game. Um, and I've put this new version in the Dropbox so everybody can take advantage of that, use it to update their own code if they like. And of course, do anything that you like to make it even better. Um, so one thing I've done, I ultimately like to modularize all of my computer programs. So I made a separate file here that I call projectile trajectory.py. Okay. And all I've done is put a bunch of little functions in here that do calculations that I might want to use over and over again in my main Jupyter code, but which I don't want to have in the Jupyter notebook cluttering things up. So you see, I have a new import command up here at the top. 
says import projectile project three. Okay, and that just takes into my code all of the functions that I have here. So you see, for example, a square root function, that's very trivial, it's just an abbreviation for one pi dot square root. I've got um, this little calculation that we already did when I introduced this project. These things like these thetas should be familiar. The expressions with the square roots and so on. I have a theta one and a theta two for the two different solutions that you can get. And I've also done a little check here to tell me whether the um, quantity under the square root the discriminant is negative, in which case it's not really an acceptable solution. Um, I have a few other functions that I've added. So, for example, monster time tells me exactly how long it takes from when I fire the ball lightning gun until the projectile hits the monster. So, it's a function that takes the initial velocity here, the initial positions, gravitational acceleration, and flag to tell me which solution I want to use. So solution is going to be either one or two. Um, and then it returns, as long as I get some reasonable theta, it returns a time interval for the projectile to hit the target. Okay. You see, I've got some comments up at the top to try to explain what's happening down below. That's always a good thing. And in fact, I probably should have a lot more commenting. And if this was something that I was asking students to turn in that I would grade, I would demand that there be even more comments than what I've got here. Um, and finally, I've got some functions that tell me x position versus time and y position versus time. So I can see where the where the projectile is in the horizontal position at any given time and where it is in the vertical position at any given position or at any given time. So for, for example, for the xt trajectory, that's what this xt means x versus time, xt traj. Again, I have to give it the initial speed. I have to give it an acceleration for the acceleration of gravity. Coordinates del x del y relative to the origin for the monster, a solution, and then t can be a time from, from the start, or it can be a list of times. Okay. Let's see how that works. And then it returns a position in the horizontal direction. Position that just comes from the kinematical equations that we reviewed and that we discussed um, in the very first lectures that I did. And then I've got something exactly analogous for y versus time. And I import all of these functions into the Jupyter library. You might notice that I imported some other things relating to animation. From using from that plot, plot with an animation function. You'll see how to use that down below. Okay. okay, now I've defined in the notebook, I'm starting in the notebook now. Note that I've added a lot more commenting. So, proj one and proj two, those return angles. The angle that I need to shoot the projectile, and the one and two indicates whether it's says one of the solution one or solution two solutions. And all I've done here is define these these functions. What you see, what I have to do if I want to get project chip trajectory. Okay, go back here. Look what project traj is. That returns the angle given an initial speed, an initial a um, Gravitational acceleration, coordinates for the monster, and an indication of the solution. Okay, if I use that now in Jupyter, I have to 
make a call like this. So projectile trajectory, that's what I imported up here at the top. And then the dot proj traj says to use this function, proj traj inside projectile trajectory. Okay, and I would rather not have to write that out every time I want to call that. So that's one reason why I made a new function inside of the, the program here. And also I would rather not have to put one or two inside of the parentheses every time I want to call one of these functions. So I make one function for when I want to use solution one and one function for when I use when I use solution two. Okay. Hey, Ted, I think yeah. I can't hear your audio. I don't know if it's on right now. You can't hear me at all? Oh, I couldn't hear you for a second. I wasn't sure if it was your audio was fading a little bit, but I can hear you now. OK. It's just it's, it's a little muffled. It's OK. But, uh, try a little bit more. It's okay now. I can hear you right now, but it, it just comes in and out a little bit. Hey Ted, you went up to have a, a headset. Do you? That might help. Uh, Maybe uh, change the microphone out. No, is it any better now? That's better now. I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, everything's good. Okay. So traj one and traj two now return the trajectory, so the actual path. So what I passed to traj one, these are new functions. I could put them over here and project out of trajectory, but I can do that later. I pass to it a bunch of X's, so X could be a list of horizontal positions. And then what Traj1 returns is a list of corresponding Y positions. So that's that's the positional trajectory. And of course, I have to say, what is the initial speed and what are the coordinates of the monster? And the one and the two, again, just correspond to um, the different solutions that I can get from this one. Week. Okay, and note that I'm using here proj one and proj two again. Okay, so that sort of streamlines some things. Now, just to reproduce what I had before, let me choose some initial coordinates for the monster and an initial speed to mess around with. And here I've made a plot again. I think last time I hadn't um, included as many labels on the plot. And I won't dwell on that because it's basically a repeat of before. Okay. Now I make an array of plots. I don't know if you guys have seen that yet. What I want to do is see if I can confirm that wherever I move the monster's position, I still am able to use these functions to hit the monster. Okay. So you see what I've done here. I've been made a sort of crude change of the position. Here I have a figure. I'm, I'm creating a figure, and then I have a like this it's called subplot okay. and what that means you see it says two three one inside there what that means is that i'm going to create an array of figures that has two rows and two rows so two rows like this and three columns 
So you scroll down and you can see what I'm talking about. There are two rows here and three columns. Right? Okay. Excuse me, one second. And then the last number here just tells me which number of figure I'm referring to. So one means the upper left first figure here. And this is just like what we plotted above. And now I want to see what happens if I shift the position of the monster up by a factor of two. So shift it vertically up by multiplying the position del y, what I started with, up here by a factor of two. Now it's going to be a 120. So you see on the figure, I move the monster up, move the monster up here, relative to here. And of course, I still hit it. These are the two solutions. Okay. Building up different levels of sophistication that you can use when you make these plots. Okay. And I'll leave it to you to go through the rest of these examples where I've done things like reposition the monster horizontally. If you look at number three, that's 1.2 times delta x. So I put the monster further out to the right. Of course, I always hit the monster. Okay. To show you something else that you can do. I'm going to plot basically the same kind of trajectories. Okay, but I want to see what they look like relative to each other, compared to each other. And so let me again start over by defining a range of x positions that I'm going to send to my functions. Position, an initial position for the monster and an initial um, initial initial speed, v0. And now I'm going to make a new graph that illustrates several things, several things that you can see. One thing is I've got a legend here. You can see how I make a, a legend with this first line here. So soul solution, soul one means solution one. Okay. And then I write some text that I want to put into the legend. I've got a command that tells me the dimensions of the figure that I want to draw. And then instead of just drawing trajectories for these um, conditions, I want to draw a whole bunch of trajectories modified a little bit. And for illustration, let's modify it by increasing the initial speed a bunch of times. So I've got a four command here. Where I'm the sort of arbitrarily chose for an illustration to let i go from um, really from 0 to 15, or 0 to 14, right? And um, you see what I'm, I'm, I'm making plots with trage 1 and trage 2. And I make the plot a whole bunch of times, and each time with a slightly different v. Uh, initial velocity or initial speed that is. So I increase the initial speed by units of five meters per second every time I redraw the trajectory. And I'm going to put them all on the same graph so that I can see what happens as I increase the initial speed. Another thing you can see is that I've labeled the colors here. So M for magenta and C for cyan. The cyan is the number two solutions, and the magenta is the number one solutions, as our legend down here says. And I've made some nice labels for the x and y axes, as well as as a title ball lightning jump trajectory. This command right here allows me to adjust. You know, the positioning of the graph relative to the title and the axis labels I suggest maybe playing around with that. 
And here's the command that puts the life in you. Okay. Now you see, you can sort of play around with what you input, see what kind of trends there might be. So for example, note that there's this line down here. It looks like all of these cur curves have collapsed right along the line on zero. So that corresponds to all the solutions for which I can't really hit the target. I'm um, set theta equal to zero whenever I um, got a discriminant that didn't work. So that means that the initial initial speeds that I used are not really enough to hit the target. At a certain point, I can hit the target. And you see I've got two solutions that, that are sort of qualitatively different. One is like I'm just shooting it directly at the target. And in the other case, I sort of shoot it straight up in a top fly kind of style, and then it comes back down on top of the target. Okay. Continuing, um, I might want to ask not whether it hits the target and what path it takes, but actually how long it takes to hit the target. Um, so that's what we'll do next. Okay, so remember what we had in my other file for monster time. Monster time is down here. Okay. And that returned the amount of time that I needed to wait for the projectile to hit the target. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose some input from the initial speed that I just chose to be 100 meters per second. Um, we'll continue to use the del x, del y that we had before. And let's look at solution two. So I'm going to call this del t sol 2, the, the time interval for solution two for this particular example. And then I'm going to make an array, or, or rather a list of times to represent the the intervals of time that I'm interested in. It goes from zero all the way to the end time interval. And let's step by units of 0 0.05 um, seconds. That's something we can get around with. And then I'm going to use these functions that I described earlier, x versus time drag and y versus time drag. Probably better names that could be used for those functions, maybe you guys can think of them. Okay, so I'm going to make a y versus time solution and an x versus time solution. And this is for solution two. And I'm going to do all of those steps again for solution one just to. And then I think um, I won't go into too much detail about how I did these figures because it's essentially a repeat of what we had before. But what I do is I plot x versus time, one of the solutions, and um, y versus time for the other solution. And now you see that I have a typo here because I copied and pasted these two and I didn't update the way I labeled those. This obviously should be Ted, are you still there? Yes, can you hear me? Good. Yeah, you just went quiet. I wasn't sure if it was your mic or. Yeah, there was something wrong with my uh, Jupyter notebook, so I'm going to it. Gotcha.
who maybe want to hang on a second. Okay. I was going to say, we can go to Alex and come back. What the? Oh, seems like it's still working. Um, so while you do that, we're getting some questions okay. from Rishi B from Virginia asking if where in Dropbox they can find uh, Professor Rogers code. So that should be in project one, the project one folder that is. And the name is Ball Lightning, balllightning.ipy notebook. And just remember, you also got, have to get uh, projectile trajectory, or excuse me, projectile trajectory.py. So they have to install, do they have to install anything other than what's already there? They don't need to install anything else. So as long as you have, uh, uh, can, can use a Jupyter notebook. Sounds good. So, go to project number one, and then go to balllightning.ipymb. The Jupyter notebook, and then also you have to make sure to have the projectile underscore final. Okay, so going back to the ball lightning. Everybody hear me? So we, yeah, so people are, are having issues to hear you as well. It's not just me. Um, so we have some people asking if you can, uh, yeah, if you can speak a little louder, perhaps they can maybe hear you a little bit better. Okay, can you hear me better? Yeah, we can hear you now and, and it, it comes, it, we can hear you well like maybe every two word, you know, for every three words, two words are clear and then the third is not so clear. Um, okay. So That's maybe right. just try to speak up maybe the whole time, maybe we can hear you. Okay. Okay, so I just wanted to fix this, this label here. Okay. And for each of these graphs, I have exposition versus time. And I've put both of the solutions. I should probably put a legend as well. I didn't get to yet, but you can just follow the same steps that we did up here. And I decided to make one of the lines dashed. So to see how I did that, note that I put in um, quotes here, single quotes, dash, dash, that makes the green line here dashed, and I've also got colors here. So I've got color equal to G, that makes this line green. So this is solution two, and the blue line is solution one. It's set to be blue by this command right here. Okay. Okay, now I wanted to make a, an animation. So that's the final thing we're gonna talk about here. And we have to animate uh, something. Something has to represent the projectile. And I'm just going to use a dot or a circle filled in. So I've got some little snippets of code here just to represent how to make a dot on graph. So it's fairly self-explanatory. I'm going to write fig make a figure. I'm going to make the axes here. And then circle, this command here makes the circle. It's going to be filled in. It takes the default color. And the way to read this is that the first entry here represents the coordinates. So you see in the graph, the circle is at two and two, and it's got a radius of 0.1. Okay, so this entry right here represents the radius. So we can try changing that around. Let's make that bigger. Make it 0 0.4. I can change the position a little bit and I can make it 2.1 and 2.1. So that 
pushes it pushes it up to the upper right. 2.3, 2.3. Okay, so you see how that works. So now if I take this circle that I defined up here and I just print circle, you see what it actually looks like. There's an X, Y coordinate and I set it to be 2.3 just now. And it's got a radius, which I set to be equal to 0 0.4. Everybody still hearing me? Yeah, we're hearing you much better now. Okay, good. Okay, so now as I go through an animation, basically you're showing a picture of the circle on the graph at each interval of time. So we're going to take the time from zero to the final time where the projectile hits the monster, we chop it up into little steps, and we're going to redraw the circle at each of those little steps at the position where the circle should be at that time. So we need a function that updates the position of the circle over and over again in accordance with the kinematical equations that we know. Right? So what do I have here? I've got an update function. Okay? I is going to represent the interval that we're interested in. And intervals is the list of intervals, the list of time intervals. And of course, we need to send it um, the initial speed and the and the initial angle, and circle is the circle. Okay, so when I do an update, I set time equal to be to whatever interval we've got. I'm going to set x and y to be the positions corresponding to that time, that trajectory. And then I'm going to set the center of the circle to be at those positions, and then I'm going to return that circle. Okay, so that's really all I need to do. Now I want to make the animation. Okay. To be able to display interactive stuff, I need to use this command right here. Okay. And I'm going to get all the information that I need in order to make the animation. So I need set of X positions, just like I needed when I made the figures at the top of the Jupyter Notebook. So I make a range of X positions. Okay. I'm going to use the same del X, del Y. Probably should put this X down here, but I'm going to start with the same X position that I had before. I might tweak some of the other things. And then I need a, a, an angle that corresponds to that particular del X and del Y. So I define the angle here. Um, I need the time in order to say how long until the projectile hits the monster target. So I do delta T sol one equal to what I had before. And then I'm gonna make a list of time intervals a list of a list of specific time instances that go from zero to the time here when projectile hits the monster. I'm going to make the intervals all of length 0 0.05 seconds. So I've got a list starting at zero going out to delta to sol one with ticks the time of 0 0.05 seconds, and I make that list and call that T sol one. And then I just need to call the function that makes the circle. So I'm going to do everything that I did above to make a circle. So just recall this little set of commands. I'm going to basically repeat that here. I'm also going to make a graph of the trajectory. That's what this command does. Yeah, of course, I have to make the axes for the plot. And remember what traj1 is. That gives me the trajectory for this particular del x, del y, and v0. Okay. 
Then on top of that, I want to draw the circle. So I do add patch circle, and it's going to be the circle at whatever whatever time starts out with. But then I'm going to call the animation function. Okay. The animation function was something that we imported up here at the top. We imported all the libraries that we want to use. So don't forget this. Thank you. Okay. It takes the figure, so fig. Okay. That's the first argument. And then update is this function that we that we used. It's going to be what we animate essentially. You have to specify what the arguments are for update. So we need the circle, the time interval, the initial speed, and the particular angle that we're using. So all of these have been established further up. We need to specify how many frames there are going to be in this movie. And the frames, is, the number of frames is just going to be the number of time steps that we have. So T soul is going to be the length of T soul. Interval tells you how much of a pause there is between each, um, each frame. So maybe just play around with that. All right, blit equals true. What that essentially does is it tells it to only redraw at each step in the animation the whatever has changed in the animation. So don't redraw the entire graph every time. That can make things run more smoothly. So I usually do that. And repeat equal true just means repeat the animation every time you do it. So this is what that looks like. So it's repeating. Ball comes up, comes down, and hits the target. So this is what I exported, saved as an MP4, and put in the Dropbox folder. Click here to stop it. Okay, I only slightly extended that because I wanted to see if I can compare the animation for the one solution and the other solution. So this is solution one that we're looking at for this particular uh, set of parameters for the for the jet file. Okay. Hey, hey Ted, just so you know, it's getting muffled again. Okay, I'm almost done, so don't have to be tortured by <laughs> trying to hear me. Um, one more. Example here. Can everybody hear me now? Yep. Okay. So essentially, what I've done here is repeat this animation, but I've put two animations on top of each other one for solution one and one for solution two. Okay. So that we can see which one actually hits the target first. We could do it just by calculating, but it's more fun to watch the animation and see which ball lightning projectile actually arrives and hits the monster before the other. Okay, so which one wins, essentially. I've made the projectile yellow to sort of evoke some fireball type of thing. And now you see that the lower solution um, reaches the target much faster, might be intuitive, but you can see it there now. And maybe I won't step through every step here because it's essentially just a repeat of what we did for the single animation here. I'll just let you pick it apart and ask any questions if you have any. And as usual, this is only the beginning of what you can do. You can um, expand on this quite a bit. I encourage everybody to try to do that. So that's really all I had for today. Be happy to answer any questions about this. Um, but I think I'll stop.
then and send it back to the others. Great, thanks, Seth. Um, so what we'll do is um, people take a few minutes. So there's a little bit of time delay between what we say and what they hear. Uh, and so perhaps what we'll do is um, move on to Alex and let people send their questions as we, um, as Alex speaks. So they can send whatever questions they might have about your program and then we can try to address them afterwards, okay? So, sure. um, great. So thanks, Ted. Um, and just for everybody, just so you know, the code, as we mentioned earlier, is on the Dropbox folder for project number one. So you can play around with that code. Uh, just copy and paste it and make it your own. Um, and so next, we've, we've received several questions. People are still a little unclear on how to plot and how to make error bars. Um, and so um, Alex Stursu, who is a one of our TAs is going to give us a little demo on how to use these things. So um, just to refresh your uh, your memory and also to supplement with what you've already learned. So Alex, do you want to take it over? Yep, I'm ready to go. Sounds good. Great. So I'll stop sharing. And Sounds you should, you're able to take charts now. Uh, so everyone should be seeing uh, my code. Yep, that's great. Excellent. Uh, so I'm going to just be running you through a quick little uh, matplotlib uh, demo, and uh, all of this code is available on the Dropbox in the in the main folder. And I've commented it heavily, so hopefully you can read through this code and the comments without need for watching the video again. Um, and this is just to kind of get you familiar with the basics of how uh, plotting works. So at the beginning, I just import the uh, necessary packages uh, for matplotlib. The necessary package is matplotlib.pyplot. And the standard way to call it is just as plt, so that we don't have to type this out every single time. Uh, in these two lines, I've just created some data to, uh, to plot, nothing fancy. And uh, over here is my first example. Uh, these uh, first two lines of code you'll see is just so that I can switch between different types of plots uh, instead of having to switch between uh, uh, files. So if we go ahead, we see in this environment that I just call plt.plot. This is just the basic plotting function. And the first argument is your uh, independent variable. And the second one is your dependent variable. And depending on the IDE you use and the settings you have, uh, your plots might show just fine without having to use plt.show. However, it's quite standard to use this. A uh, it, it, good way to think about what plt.show does is kind of like a, a full stop or a period at the end of a sentence after you've set all your plotting settings. So if we go ahead and run this, uh, this should be, you should see a small little figure. And that's exactly what we expect. Pretty basic to begin with. Nothing fancy. If we go ahead and move to the uh, second example, all I've done is just show you that you can actually mathematically manipulate uh, your uh, data inside of the plotting function. So instead of plotting y, I plot uh, something else here. Uh, I plot the uh, uh, independent variable to the third power. So if we go ahead and run this, you see it works much the same. Nothing too difficult there. So moving on, uh, the, the great thing about uh, matplotlib is its functionality. You can do a whole bunch of things, customize your plots however you want. And in these next two uh, examples, I'll just show you some of the uh, settings that you can play with. Uh, now, some of the settings have to be called as other functions. Usually, uh, the, the main ones that you will have to deal with are the labels. So if you want to label your graphs, you need to call plt.xlabel or ylabel. And then in the argument, you want to put whatever you want to label them in between um, quotation marks. Uh, and if you want to set limits uh, for the range of your graph, uh, you do so with plt.xlim or ylim. 
and it requires two arguments, the smallest limit and the largest limit. So when we go ahead and run this, you'll see that my plot ranges from negative five to five, as it shows here in the code, and from zero to 40. And I've also changed the color. Color is one of the settings that you can change inside the plot function itself. Uh, and that's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can also see that I've labeled X and Y. And you can see that uh, in the second example, it's exactly the same as the first, just with some different parameters. So we can see here, I've changed the uh, limits of the graph, and I've actually changed the color and set markers. So what this does is it plots a marker at each data point itself. And uh, if we zoom in, you can see that at each data point, there is a little marker, a little circle uh, designated by marker equals zero, uh, O inside of uh, the quotation marks. That's pretty straightforward as well. So now what about error bar? Well, error bar works much the same as the plotting function except that it takes two extra uh, arguments. Uh, so I've created some extra data. One is just a single number. Another is a uh, data set that has the same uh, size as the independent variable. So you have to have the size of your error bar data match up with the size of what you're actually plotting, uh, or else you'll get mistakes, uh, or else you get issues. Um, either that, or you can just set a single value as your error for all of them. So I highly encourage, and I will show after this graph, to go to the uh, matplotlib documentation page, and it'll give you a rundown of all the different settings you can play with, you can change, and it'll give you a very nice breakdown on how to think about all of this. So let me just change this. And we can see here in the error bar function, we have the same first two arguments. And then I call the second, the third argument, sorry, y error equals error set one. So our error bars uh, for the vertical axis, uh, axis should be a constant two, whereas our error bars for the horizontal axis should actually change from the leftmost point, which would be no error, to the rightmost point, which would be the largest error available. I've changed the color to green and the format of the data points as squares, just to change things up. So when we run this, and if I make this full screen, you can see as expected, the error bar on the vertical axis is just constant throughout the graph. But as we move from left, where we had the smallest error, to the right, where we had the, uh, the largest error, you see the horizontal axis come into play. So if I zoom into that right there, you can see we now have both vertical and horizontal error bars. And there are many different uh, settings to play with to make this nicer, to, to change things up, to change the size of the uh, labels, to change the size of the uh, tick marks, uh, all sorts of things to play with. Uh, and that can all be found at the link here. Uh, you can simply Google matplotlib error bar documentation, and it should take you to a page like this, where you can see uh, at the beginning we have how to call the function. Now we didn't we used PLT to shortcut having to use uh, the full extension at the beginning, and it kind of breaks down what the uh, what the arguments of the function are. So we see x, y, y error, x error, these types of things. Now, error bar actually works a lot like uh, the regular plot function if you do not specify any uh, y error or x error. Uh, in the documentation page, you'll find an explanation not just of what the arguments of the function are, but what they do, a breakdown of what is acceptable, um, uh, acceptable inputs. Uh, and uh, if you scroll down, the fun is at Quarks. Quarks are keyword arguments, and this is these are all the little settings you can play with that change the color of the plots, the size of uh, different things that you want to play with, and it includes a wealth of information that you can look up and and uh, customize your 
your plots with. And uh, that's all I have. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, hopefully that clear clarifies some of the questions that some of you have had. Uh, if they don't, if you still have outstanding questions, uh, please um, send them our way and we can try to um, feel free to ask right now and see if we can address them right away. Um, but I'm sure, you know, with most of these programming, you know, programming in general, things start to make become a lot clearer once you start playing with the code yourself. And the beauty of programming is that you can test the code, run it, and see if it works and if it doesn't. And once you get it to, you know, once you figure out the bug, and this is what we're here for, right? You can send us the errors that you're making in the Slack chat, and we can try to address them. Once you, we, you resolve those bugs, then you can start playing with parameters and seeing, you know, what happens if I change certain arguments of the error through the error bar function. How does your plot look like? So uh, we're, the purpose of this class is to encourage you to play around with coding as much as possible. Okay. So thank you so much, Alex. Um, so why don't I give a little bit of review of what we saw in the last class, uh, in the last week's class, and start introducing some new, um, some new topics today. I don't think we're gonna get to the point where I'll be able to assign a new project. So if you're still working on previous projects, which I think many of you are, you can just uh, really, you know, be a little, take a little sigh of relief. Today we'll talk about some concepts and some new ideas in uh, data analysis and fitting, um, but I'm probably not gonna assign you a new project, okay? So just to review what we've seen. So we've learned about distributions so being able to make uh, statistical samples of uh, a population and trying to assess uh, what is the distribution of different um, measurements of that population. So we use examples of heights for, for both men and women, and we were able to make histogram plots where the histogram plots, what they're telling us is the number of counts associated with a, a particular measure, which is uh, what appears in the horizontal axis. So we played around, gave you a little bit of introduction and talked about uh, particular people that are outliers in these types of measurements. Uh, we've introduced averages, uh, and here's the definition of the average. The, the average. Then we introduced standard deviation, uh, and we considered different definitions of standard deviation, both for uh, a the standard deviation for a population or a sample of the population, uh, and we talked about the standard error. And, and the thing that we're going to be considering here it primarily is the uh, standard deviation for a sample of the population as a whole. And what this gives you is, is that if you measure the, if you make a plot of the histogram of your um, sample distribution, the distribution of your sample, sorry. Um, what your standard deviation illustrates uh, or is defined is that if you take a step to the right, so if you take a whole standard deviation step to the right from your average, where your average is this X bar, if you take a standard a step towards the right and then take a step towards the left, uh, everything that is between is approximately 68% of your, uh, of where your samples lie. And so it's it, the standard deviation is a good measure to tell you how broad or narrow is uh, your distribution. And so it, it plays an important role in, in statistics everywhere. And so what we show when we mean error, when we're showing error bars, what we show is we illustrate the mean value, and then we show the error bar expands from X bar plus sigma all the way down to X bar minus sigma. And so that's telling you, is also illustrating a simpler way, it's, it's giving you a representation, a simple representation of this distribution, assuming that is a Gaussian distribution, uh, and it's telling you approximately where 68% of your, of your distribution lies. Okay, so that's, that's the importance of uh, the standard deviation. Um, and towards the second half of last week, uh, we talked about set pressure relativity a little bit, um, introduce a relativistic energy uh, where the energy of a particle with a mass m is equal to the square root of the mass squared plus the momentum squared. Uh, we gave a definition for momentum. 
that um, that is familiar to those of you that have taken uh, classical mechanics, uh, but we define it relativistically. So the momentum in general, what it is, is essentially is a quantity is a quantity that tells us how hard it is to stop a moving object. And uh, in classical mechanics, it's just defined as the mass of the particle times the velocity. Uh, Einstein taught us that that's a, a simplified, that's a low energy approximation for momentum, and we show you the most general uh, expression. Uh, and this expression holds uh, for the energy, so it's a relationship between the energy, the mass of the particle, and the momentum of the particle. This holds if I set the speed of light equal to one, which I argued that or explained that's what we do, and this is very common in particle physics. Okay, uh, and so we introduce the energy and the relativistic energy and the relativistic momentum, uh, and explain that as far as we can see in nature, uh, we see that momentum and energy are conserved. In every single in every single reaction out there, uh, and we consider the implication for this in a in a toy example of a uh, of a decay process. Okay, so let me review the two projects that uh, we introduced last week, um, and perhaps if you still have any questions uh, about this, I see many of you already are uh, advanced have advanced in this project. Some of you have started the second project. Um, and so it's never too late. You can still catch up if you haven't. Don't feel discouraged. We want to encourage you to 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 get engaged. Okay. So the first project was to the idea was to measure, try to determine pi statistically. So using statistics. And so the idea the, the idea of this project is to uh, design a square, put random points inside of that square. Uh, and then label the, the ones that lie inside of the circle. So you define a circle that lies inside of the square, label those as blue. And so what you have to do is just randomly sample points inside of the square uh, and count the number of those, the fraction of those that lie inside of the circle. Okay. So the fraction of the number of blue dots over the total number of points uh, is going to be equal to the area of the circle divided by the area of the square which gives you a way to, to determine pi from these statistical numbers, okay? Uh, and some of you have seen people making progress, and so uh, what you should be doing is generating um, point, uh, plots like this where you sample, uh, let's say you put 100 dots and there's the ones inside of the circle blue, the, the ones outside of the, uh, uh, outside of the circle red, uh, and then just count those numbers, count the number of points that are blue divided by the total number of points, okay? Uh, and that is going to be uh, a way to determine pi. And, and you should get something like this, that is, as the number of points increases, the, the faster you converge to, to the value of pi. Um, and, and some people, so we, I then gave a, um, a more challenging second exercise. So I think this part most people got. So that's great. Good. If you haven't gotten this far, send us comments in Slack and we'll try to address them or send us an email. Um, this second part was a lot more confusing. And so let me try to break down um, what this second part is meant to do. Uh, and so hopefully it clarifies some questions that I've been receiving. Let me try to connect my iPad here on the fly. Maybe while I'll do this, Alex, do you see any questions addressed towards you or Ted? Uh, are there any questions that um, you see that were addressed to you that you want to um, address or answer? None for me so far. Okay. So I think there was only one question addressed to me. I, uh, I forward one? you four that I wasn't really sure if were ones that could be addressed. You forwarded me four. Yeah, they're on the on the Skype oh, chat. Okay. I just need to scroll down. Okay, it looks like I might be able to sh 
there. Um, okay, so maybe I'll, some of these are kind of difficult questions. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why I passed them on to you instead of trying to answer them. <laughs> Um, so let's see, there are essentially two questions that are very similar, ma mainly asking about whether you can make more sophisticated sort of games and animations and so forth in Python. And of course the answer is yes. Um, there are some, I'm, I have some good references too, but I might need to go root around for them. Um, there are some good online tutorials for constructing games, but you generally need to include some more uh, libraries and so forth if you really want to do something serious. What I've done here is more like what I would do if I were making a talk where I wanted to uh, make an anima animation to visualize some concept um, in a nice way, but I would probably not make a Py IPython notebook or Jupyter notebook um, to be a game. Um, there's another question about, say, bar graphs and pie graphs and so on. Um, so there, yeah, you can do all that stuff. Matplotlib has um, has stuff for all of that. Um, and really, you just need to go to the go type in um, matplotlib into Google and go to the web page where they've got documentation for gazillions of different functions and, and utilities that you can use for these things. Um, if there are any specific ones that are very that are that are of great interest, I can try to make some more examples but there's an essentially endless number of variations on things that you can do. There's a lot of interactive stuff like things with slider bars where you can slide a bar back and forth to see how it affects a graph. As you slide it, the graph will change in real time. Um, there are many different things similar to that. Um, so there's a question, how, how can you incorporate the Coriolis effect into the frame of the ball trajectory in the projectile motion? Okay, to, to incorporate the Coriolis effect, you'd have to modify the equations that we used. The equations that we used were the simplest kinematical equations that you can have when you just got a constant acceleration. Um, and they become considerably more complicated if you want the Coriolis effect. Now, I would suggest that before you include the Coriolis effect, you would want to include some other things like, for example, air resistance. That's one of the effects that I often assign to students who are taking class on this. You start with this simple parabolic motion and then add a term into an equation Usually we use differential equations to correct it for the effect of air resistance, which is usually a lot greater than um, the Coriolis effect. Um, and for most practical cases, you wouldn't have to worry about the Coriolis effect. Um, it does play a role over very large distances. So if you've got, let's say, an artillery cannon, they're in World War I or something, and you're shooting something 50 miles away, I know they did have to take into account things like the Coriolis effect um, to get precision uh, targets. But um, I would suggest if you want to expand on the actual equations, first look into things like air resistance and so on. OK, so I think that covers questions. I hope that was at least reasonably helpful. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Yeah, yeah, and this reminds me. So I hear some of you are interested in, in gaming, um, 
and this I would uh, encourage you next week we're going to have a, a activity a mini class that is going to take place on July 22nd so this would be the Wednesday um, being hosted by uh, Professor Chang who is a professor in computational modeling simulation uh, engineering here at Old Dominion University so we have a, a whole program on, on modeling computational modeling so if you're interested in, in gaming technology I would encourage you to participate in this class it's not too late um, so you should go to this so it is uh, touching on coronavirus simulation using gaming technology so that's closely tied to what you're you've been asking about so perhaps let me let me go back now to explaining what these figures are so in particular what am I plotting on this bottom point? So I'm, I'm, I'm generating, in short, what I'm doing is that I'm generating an ensemble of estimates of pi using this number of points, okay? And so let me give you a little outline of how that code works. And you can see my code uh, in the project three folder but let me give you a sketch of how it works. So first I define some function. Let me call it pi func. okay? And I think this part, most of you have been able to do where the input is nt, nt being the total number of points, t being total. Uh, and so this is the total number of points that have gone inside of the box. And then after following essentially the expressions that we already re reviewed in the, in the slides, and I've already discussed how to estimate this. This gives me back a estimate. So if you can read my chicken scratch, uh, that's estimate of pi, okay? And so the next thing that I do is that for, let me, um, I don't remember exactly how I do this, but it doesn't matter. Let's just, uh, let's, do it on the fly. So here's a code that I think should work. Let me make a list that is uh, points that is, is empty, okay? And I'm gonna call that ends. Ends for ensemble, okay? So I'm gonna make this a empty list. And then what I'm gonna do is make a loop for uh, I zero, for I zero, or let's just do i for i in uh it doesn't matter how many points i put let's do for range uh let's say 500 okay what i do is that i just call this function over and over again using the same value of nt okay so let me define nt to be so if i wanted to reproduce this plot here, nt is 10 to the 2, meaning 100, okay? So what I do is that I just fix nt, and I set this to 100, okay? And so I'm going to call this function above and estimate. Let's call this pi 0. I'm going to call that uh, the result that comes out from pi func, where I've called using the value of nt, which is 100, okay? And I'm gonna call this over and over and over again. Each time I'm getting an independent measure of the of pi. And so then I'm gonna grab each independent measure and append it to my ensemble list, uh, pi zero, okay? And so that's how I generate a estimate of pi. And so each one of these points, uh, so if I plot, let's say here I'm plotting pi uh, or my estimate of pi. So it's the axis of my, uh, of this, okay? And then on the X axis, what I'm showing is NT, okay? And so if I fix, let me move this a little bit. Let's make this axis bigger. 
okay? And so if I fix this to be, if I fix NT to be 100, I'm over here, okay? And here is, uh, let's say this is the actual value of pi right here. 3.14, yada, 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 okay? And so what I, each time I call this function, I end up getting a, I'm never gonna actually land on the actual value. I'll get a point. Let's make it a different color. So I'll get a point, and then a point, and then another point, and then another point, da da da, da right? And so it's gonna be a random distribution that is centered around the actual value of pi, okay? And it's gonna be a total 500 points. I don't remember how many I used. It doesn't matter. You can play with this, right? Use 500, use 1,000, whatever number you wish, okay? Um, and then what I show is again, the mean value of this distribution, which is gonna be pretty close to pi. Um, and then standard deviation where 60% 60% uh, of this distribution lies. Okay. And so how do I get the, the mean value of this distribution? Well, using the function that we talked about in last class, right? So we can use uh, the mean where, well, in the previous slides, we've shown what these functions are. So you can use mean, uh, mean numpy. Uh, you can just use a standard deviation to calculate the standard deviation. Uh, and then for plotting, you can just use the error bar functions that Alex just covered, okay? So hopefully that clarifies what is being plotted over here. And I repeat it, then this for NT of 100, and then NT of 1,000, and so forth and so forth, okay? And here you can see a picture of my distribution for the largest value. Uh, and you can see that it's uh, pretty closely centered. I think it's the largest value. It might've been uh, one of the bigger values, but you can see that it's, it's distributed. The mean value is pretty close to the actual value of pi. And then you have one standard deviation where all the points lie. Um, and you can see that the number, the error bar is decreasing with the, lar the biggest numbers of, of NT. Okay. So hopefully that clarifies things. Uh, if not, um, let us know. And then the last project was a two-particle decay process where you have a single particle decaying into two particles, and you've known, you were told the mass of particle, the original particle, A, particle A, which had a mass of two, and then you were told the mass of one of the particles is one, and then I gave you the momentum of one of the particles. We use momentum conservation to relate the momentum of this particle to the momentum of this particle, okay, because the original particle was at rest. Also, uh, we use energy conservation to then relate the mass of particle, the particle that you haven't seen. So there's a particle that doesn't hit your detector. So you have this original particle you know is there, this other particle you see in your detector, this one you miss altogether, and the question is, what is this mass? And so what I did is that I gave you a distribution of um, momenta. We solve for the mass of particle C as a function of particle A, the, uh, as a function of the mass of particle A, the mass of particle B, and then the momentum that was measured. I gave you a list of momenta. Um, I showed you some code for how to determine these uh, to how to load this data. So you have a thousand measurements of the momentum of particle uh, particle B. I showed you how to plot it. So I gave you code here for you to be able to plot this, uh, and you should be able to see the sh the the um, see the values themselves, the type of the array. So you see that I'm printing an array, I'm printing the type, which just tells you that it's an array. Um, and then uh, the shape of this distribution, which is a one dimensional distribution of size 1000. Um, and then you can make a histogram of that. And so what you had to do, and hopefully you did it, is to use this function, create a function that determines the mass of C as a function of the determined momentum. And then all you had to do was just plot it after you loaded it, 
plot it uh, 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 using a histogram function, calculate the mean and the standard deviation. And what you should have gotten is something like this. So very, very close to 0.2. Uh, so it's, it's uh, maybe less than a percent away from 0.2 and then the standard deviation should be 0 0.01. Hopefully you were able to do this. If you haven't been able to do this, um, send us comments and we can try to help you get there. Uh, and, and also I put now on the Dropbox, the input value that I use for MC. So what I did was exactly generate a, a distribution for MC center around 0.2 with the standard deviation and that's how I generated the data for the momentum. And so if you're getting a distribution like this, uh, you're good to go. Okay, so this is my placeholder now to answer questions. Um, I feel like we've answered quite a few questions so far. So unless there's anything very, very pressing, maybe we'll go forward. Um, not nothing very pressing, but just a quick question uh, that we had from Luis Ortiz from Hidalgo, Mexico. He asks, uh, do error bars uh, show all the possible results inside a range which is defined by the standard deviation? Um, error bars can do that. Uh, if that's the data and information you put into the error bar function in Python. So yes, it can, but it's dependent on what you tell your code to do. Certainly. Yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, error bars are um, what you wanted to, you want to do. I mean, they, they're, uh, they depend on what you're plotting. So what we're plotting a lot of the times, at least here, is assuming that the distribution is, is Gaussian. And what we're showing is the min value and then um, bar plus sigma. So this is what we're defining to be the definition of the error bars in these plots, but they don't have to be that. The error bar could be whatever you want it to be, right? You then have to tell whoever seen a figure first. This is, this is generally gonna be the, the case that whatever figure you show, you have to clearly explain what you're, what you're plotting, right? You have a lot of freedom as a user to make whatever plots you want, but then you have to make them absolutely clear to the reader, okay? So if you wanna show instead of the one standard deviation, you want to show the distance from the, uh, the highest point in your distribution to the lowest point in your distribution, you can totally do that. You just have to tell that to your reader, okay? So that's perfectly fine. Um, was that, does that answer the question, Alex? I think perfectly, yeah. Awesome. And also you can make asymmetric error bars. They don't have to be symmetric. Uh, there's a lot of freedom to um, what you can use error bars for. So um, since we only have about half an hour, why don't we go on and start introducing some physics concepts and then we'll pick them back up uh, on Thursday and then we can try to apply them to some projects. So what are we gonna do to a little bit more of data analysis, more particle physics. Uh, and, and so as you might've seen from the title of the slides, uh, what we're gonna be talking about are uh, fitting in particular, which is one of the most useful tools when doing analysis of data. Um, and then also we're gonna talk about uh, bright Wigner distributions, which are very useful in data analysis and particle physics. And so we're gonna be introducing these two uh, and so I figured I would start with an example that, that we, we already touched on um, last week, which is the discovery of the Higgs. Um, as I mentioned, one of the two plots that led to the discovery of the Higgs and, and resulted in the Nobel Prize uh, was, was this. So this is, this is the data from the CMS uh, collaboration where this little bump right here, and this fits to this experimental data, so you see Experimental data, which now should start looking familiar to the error bars that you're, that you're seeing, right? What you're seeing is the, uh, the mean value of this distribution at this uh, value of the energy. So this is the energy of the final state. So you have two particles 
and the final state, which are two photons, and they have uh, energy in these units, uh, which are giga electron volts, which is a, a, a standard unit of, of energy. And what you're seeing is the mean value and the standard deviation. And this line right here is the fit to the data, and you're seeing a little bump. That bump is the Higgs, okay? And so that tiny little bump uh, led to the, the discovery of the Higgs and it resulted in the Nobel Prize uh, of these two fellows, uh, Peter Higgs and Francois Anglais, okay? And the Higgs importance is multiple, uh, but it's, it's largely, it's, it, it, the, the biggest significance is that it's responsible for giving masses to the leptons and quarks in the standard model, okay? Uh, and so this is remarkably important, and, um, and this is why it resulted in this Nobel Prize. It was also a missing piece of the standard model. As I mentioned before, uh, my collaborator and friend, Max Hansen, is gonna be talking about the, the past and future of, the, of CERN, it's going to be a talk next week on July 20th. Uh, and so I would highly, highly, highly encourage you all to participate. He's a great speaker. Uh, he's a whole lot of fun. And so if you're interested in particle nuclear physics, I would encourage you. Uh, if you know, don't know much about it, that's fine. He's just a, he's a, he's a great uh, speaker that will give you some motivation and understanding of this. Uh, also, I've already pointed you guys to this video of the Higgs being explained. Uh, and so I would encourage you to check it you haven't already. And so one thing that I like to point out that gives you a little bit of insight in why nuclear physics is important is to understand what the Higgs does and what the Higgs uh, results on um, in terms of the masses of, in terms of our masses, okay? What, so what is the implication? What is, what is the Higgs, um, what percentage of, of our mass comes from the Higgs? And to understand this, uh, let's walk a little bit through the logic. So the Higgs, as I mentioned, gives masses to leptons, which are uh, electrons and, and its family, the, the, the other particles that are in its family, uh, but it also gives mass to quarks. And we've introduced quarks a few times in the context that quarks and gluons are the objects of which particles like the proton and the neutron that we're made out of, uh, the the the, pro, the protons and neutrons which were made out of are made out of quarks and gluons. That's what I mean to say, okay? So the Higgs gives mass to the quarks. It doesn't give mass to the gluons, but it does give mass to the quarks. Uh, and the proton is, and the protons and neutrons are approximately all the source of all the mass of atoms. And we're made out of atoms. Uh, atoms are the, so this is a picture of the, of the hydrogen atom. Um, and molecules, uh, like guanine, DNA, all these molecules are made out of little atoms being combined together. And the protons and neutrons and in general nuclei are approximately 100% of the mass of atomic, of atoms, and as a consequence also of nuclei. And so um, what you might then let to believe is that the source of our mass then is naturally the Higgs, because Higgs gives mass to the quarks uh, and the proton uh, and the protons that are made out of quarks, um, and the proton gives mass to the protons and neutrons give mass to atomic molecules or atomic uh, atomic to atoms, which gives a mass to molecules. Uh, and so naturally, uh, we would expect to believe that our mass comes from the Higgs. This is um, quite natural, um, but as we will see, this is definitely not the case. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit later. Uh, but first, the, the question that I want to address is, how do we even know that this bump that we see in this uh, measurement corresponds to the Higgs itself? And more importantly, how do we get the mass from this little bump, okay? To understand this, um, I figured I would give you a little bit of overview of how particle accelerators work. Um, and here, you've seen this image before, both Ted and I have flashed this a few times, which is the particle accelerator that we have at Jefferson Lab, where we accelerate uh, electrons underground and smash them into different atomic nuclei. So here's my set of bullet points that describes particle accelerators. They're starting with point uh, step number zero, 
Uh, you're all programmers at this point, so you should know that every good list starts with zero. Uh, so step number zero is to write down a theory. We got to make some predictions of the kinds of reactions that we would see uh, in a particle accelerator that motivates the build and motivates the creation of, uh, of a particle accelerator, and then you got to build it, right? Um, of course, this is the hardest step. <laughs> Building the particle accelerator uh, is challenging. Uh, and so this is, um, and, and the idea is that what we're going to see in coming out of in particle accelerator is that anything that could be, uh, what do I want to say that here? Kind of the term. So everything that, um, that we're going to be able to see is probabilistically, okay? And you'll see this in a second. And we'll see anything that is possible within some some probability, and that's kind of the you know the guiding principle of uh, uh, of quantum mechanics, which was challenging for many people historically, uh, including our old friend uh, Arbor Einstein, who was one of the people responsible for the creation of quantum mechanics, but you know struggled with the consequences that you know nature is probabilistic, uh, and he didn't really like what this meant for some underlying god, let's say. Um, then step number one is to accelerate these particles once you build the particle accelerator, um, these subatomic particles. And in fact, let me pause here and say, if you want to learn about how we get subatomic particles, in particular electrons that we can then accelerate in particle accelerators, tomorrow we're going to have a talk uh, from one of our um, expert accelerator scientists, uh, uh, Carlos Hernandez Garcia, there's going to be tomorrow afternoon in Regis, so tune in for that. Um, so he's going to talk about how we deter extract elect electrons from matter to be able to accelerate them in particle accelerators. So once you have accelerated these particles, then we smash them with each other. Uh, and, and, they're, and what we're doing is just smashing them to be able to, uh, um, you know, interact with each other as much as possible. And we're going to uh, see how many particles are emitted in the process. A more real, real, realistic cartoon of what's happening, in particular for the types of experiments that are taking place at CERN, is that you have two protons that are being smashed against each other, uh, and as, as a function of time, they might be able to interact with each other via for perhaps emitting gluons to each other. Then at the end, uh, once these, two, these different particles interact in your initial state, um, you're going to have an array of final particles that are being emitted, and these are all the particles that could be, in general, you have different events, different distributions of particles. Uh, you can't exactly predict what will exactly happen, but what you, can, what you can predict is the probability of certain events taking place. And so um, these are simulations of the different particle tracks that can, um, that can be detected. Each one of these lines represents different particles. So this is a simulation of, a, of an actual event in an experiment. Um, and so, how do you think about what's happening? What you know? What are these different tracks and these different events? What do they mean? So, for this, it's useful to to have an even simplified picture of how the two particles in some particle accelerator may be able to interact and how they might then land on your detector. So here, each one of these bins represents a cartoon picture of a particle detector. Okay, and they're just to count a particle and count that, it, it, that a particle was there if it lands inside of the bin. And then, uh, then this is going to be attached to, this is going to be translated into some electrical signal that is going to be attached to some computer, and your computer is just going to be enumerating whether an event took place or not. And so imagine that I had two particles, and then they, they interacted with each other, they repelled each other in such a way that they would then land in two different parts of your detector like this. Uh, they would create, if they're charged, they're going to create a current, uh, even if they're not charged, but it's more complicated. But assuming that they're charged, they're going to create some current, uh, and that's going to be passed on to your computer, um, which then is going to be accounted as, a, as an event. Okay, That's what an event means in this case. And you can see that there was some event in this point of the detector and another point of the detector. Uh, of course, being able to do this in practice is remarkably challenging, but here's the basic idea. Most of the times, the particles won't interact with each other, so they'll just pass through each other without seeing each other. And I should also emphasize this picture, this effective picture, also holds if I keep one of the particles stationary while the other one is moving. Okay, uh, and then 
uh, in general, I'll have different types of interactions. This is gonna happen over and over again. Uh, and then eventually I'm gonna have enough data that then I'll be able to collect, you know, where do particles land depending on the energy as, uh, uh, associated with how I smash these particles or associated with the energy of the final state depending on the reaction. And so that's effectively what these little cartoons or what these, um, uh, these distributions are showing you. They're showing you effectively the probability of a particular event depending on the final state energy. It's, a, it's related to that, let's say. Okay. Uh, and so finally, when you've seen what's happened in the, in the outcome, so I should emphasize that you never really see what's happening in between. All you can see is you can see the initial conditions of your, of your event, and then you can see where the particles have landed. You never really see what's in the middle. You, ne you don't have a way to be able to resolve what happened in the middle. Uh, and so instead, what you have to do is compare the outcome of your event with what your theory predicted in the first place. Uh, and so this is remarkably important because if we didn't have the theory in the, split, in the first place, there would be no meaning to the experiment itself. But of course, you can say this a different way as well, which is without the experiment, uh, we wouldn't know what theory is right. So we need both experiments to tell us which theory is right, and we need theorists to be able to guide, uh, to, uh, for us to be able to understand and analyze our experimental outcomes. And so once we know which theory is right, then what we can effectively do is be able to uh, uh, rewind the, the, the video to the moment of the initial crash. And so we can give, get an insight into what was the reaction, what did the reaction look like in the moment of the reaction, despite that our, our detector does not allow us to get there. Okay, so that's my set of bullet points of how particle accelerators and detectors work. Uh, this is very simplistic because I'm a theorist and that's as, you know, this is essentially as much as I know about particle accelerators. Uh, if you want to know more, I would encourage you again to go to tomorrow's talk where you will learn a little bit more detail of the first stages of the particle accelerator. Okay, so let me move on to something that may seem um, unrelated, which is the fact that it, it turns out that there's important similarities between the physics of strings, uh, vibrating glasses, bridges, and particle physics. And, and the commonality between all of these is that uh, uh, they can all be, at some point, resonating systems, okay? Uh, and you are perhaps intuitively familiar with uh, resonating systems, in particular when it comes to strings, um, uh, swings in a, in, in a playground, uh, or with vibrating glasses, or if you want to see a somewhat catastrophic video of uh, what bridges can look like when they're being hit by wind at a resonating frequency, uh, you can go to this link. Um, and, and, and so what the common feature is, is that, or more specifically, the common feature is that at some particular value of some frequency or energy, so frequency and energy are closely related to each other, the amplitude for vibration or the amplitude for probability uh, for a particle event gets amplified, okay? And so uh, the amplitude of vibrations is, is the classical analog to this. In, in particle physics, what's important is the probability um, of a particular event gets amplified, okay? So that's, that's a common thread uh, of resonance, resonances both in classical mechanics as well as in, in particle physics, which is, uh, falls under the umbrella of quantum mechanics, okay? And so let me give you a somewhat intuitive, intuitive uh, picture of why resonances are important in, in particle physics and what do they mean? Uh, uh, and so, so resonances in experiment, they lead to an amplification of the probability of an incoming particle or incoming set of particles to interact. So most of the time, the particles, they don't really interact with each other. I've already said this. Okay, um, but if the two particles are sufficiently attracted, okay, so if the, the theory is attractive, 
between these two particles, then they can, they can create a bound state of particles, of the two particles. Um, and, and because of that, because they're attracted strongly, the probability of them interacting now increases. They want to be close to each other. And so when the two particles are, are accelerating to each other, they're more likely to see each other if they attract, the theory is attractive. And so they're going to want to pull to each other and create a little bound state of the two. So they're going to be tied together. Okay. Um, and, and this, the particular energy at which this happens is going to correspond to the resonance of, uh, of so it's going to lead to, so I should say, this little bound state is called a resonance and it carry, carries some mass m. This mass corresponds to the energy at which these two particles get attracted sufficiently tight to form this state. Uh, and the next thing is that quantum mechanics tells us that if this bound state, this intermediate bound state of particles can decay, then it will decay. Uh, and it will decay not just in any which way, or well, I should say, it's in fact it's gonna decay in all the ways that are possible that are allowed within quantum mechanics and within the rules of the standard model. Uh, and so what this does is that because it's gonna decay in multiple different ways, it will thereby increase the number of events that are detected because uh, most of the times it doesn't interact, the, the super particles don't interact, but if you hit it, if they come at some particular energy that corresponds to the mass of the system, they're gonna more likely to be able to be bound and then decay in multiple different ways. And so you have multiple different decays. And so then your detector is gonna, you're gonna have more events that are being detected. And so you're gonna be seeing an enhancement in your detections, okay? And so that's what this distribution is doing. So the, the, what you're measuring here is the detection of these final particles. And you see that at some particular energy, the, the detections of the events are increasing. So you're having an increasement of the events that you're measuring, okay? So that's the idea of resonances or bound states. Sometimes we'll refer to these particles as resonances. Sometimes some people might use the word bound state. Resonance refers to the fact that you have a particle that is bound. They're attracted, the two, the two initial particles are attracted to each other, but it doesn't live forever. It decays, okay? So it's a resonating system. Uh, very much uh, like the classical resonating systems. And here, what it leads to is a resonance in the, is at least an enhancement in the uh, probability of detection of the final states. Okay? Hopefully that made a little bit of sense. Uh, if it, do, it didn't send, mess, uh, send us uh, any comments and we would try to clarify any of these concepts, I know that there are a little bit of bends, uh, but it's good to hear these things over and over again so that you know, eventually some of the words start to click in and some of these ideas uh, become clearer. So the more you hear this, the better. And so what we're going to be doing is playing around with these kinds of uh, these enhanced uh, distributions. And, and these are described most generally by a particular probability distribution, which is, no, uh, is known as Bright Wigner, named after um, two famous physicists. Um, and here, we're not going to use the exact bright wigner distribution. In fact, we're going to use a simplified version for details I pointed to the wiki page. Um, here, I'm just going to use a, a, a somewhat simpler expression just to make our lives easy. But it, it, it really holds, um, it, it absorbs most of the key important ideas, uh, and it doesn't make a difference in what we're going to do next, okay? So this probability distribution is a distribution in energy. So we're gonna imagine again, that you're gonna have these two particles, you're gonna have particle events happening uh, and, and the, the number of events that you measure in your detector is gonna be associated with the energy of which these incoming particles are, going, uh, are uh, being smashed against each other, okay? So E is the energy of the system that you're considering. M is the mass of the resonance. Okay, so you're gonna have a resonating system that's gonna have some mass. And so uh, when the energy coincides with M, you should see an enhancement associated with this distribution. Gamma is gonna be the decay width of the resonance. Okay, that's a little bit of jargon, but basically it's gonna be, th this thing is related to the inverse of the lifetime of the resonance. How long does it live? 
okay? So the decay width is the inverse of that. It tells you the bigger this is, right? So the bigger the gamma is, this, the shorter time it lives. And so it's that much more likely to decay. And in fact, just to get some sense of scales, the kind of resonance that I study in my research particle in nuclear physics, they live in the order of 10 to a negative 23 seconds. Uh, and so the lifetime is really, really tiny, which means that their decay weights are very, they're, they're relatively high compared to other particles, okay? Uh, and so what gamma tells you is essentially of the probability of the particle to go through a decay process. And so as a function of time, what you can imagine is that you have initially some bound state of these two particles, which is our resonance. And then as a function of time, these two particles, they, they, you know, they resonate, they're close to each other, and then they're like, okay, bye, and then they're going to go off their merry ways, okay? And so as a function of time, they're going to uh, separate and decay. So gamma is telling you essentially that. And so the first thing that we're going to start doing is just plotting bright wigner functions. Uh, and so uh, let me look ahead and see where I am. Um, good, okay. So I think perhaps one of the... the things that you should start doing if you're ahead in the lectures, if you're already caught up with all the problems so far, so far is that you can start um, plotting um, this distribution, start writing code for plotting this distribution, okay? So here what I'm doing is plot, plotting a bright Wigner distribution using a value of the mass and three different values of gamma. And the question that, uh, that you should be able to answer um, by just playing around with the different values is what values did I use for the mass, okay? And so what you can do is start uh, grabbing this code if you want or write your own code for uh, determining, for plotting the distribution functions as a function of energy uh, and start playing around with plots. And, and here you can quite intuitively, in fact, you, you don't have to um, do much work in fact, you should be able to just immediately look at this plot and be able to say which value of m uh, I used. And so, um, unfortunately, I can't ask you for your feedback that quickly, so I'm gonna tell you what the answer is. And the answer is that I've used 2.5 because that corresponds to the value of the peak, okay? So this m corresponds to the value where the peak is most enhanced. Um, and so, to get some intuition, what here's my simple first exercise, which is uh, use two, using the value of m that I, the, that I just explained, 2.5, write code to plot these distributions, these bright Wagner distributions as a function of energy, and plot it for three different values of gamma, one, two, and three. And what you should do is reproduce this plot and figure out which value of gamma corresponds to which color. This is a relatively simple exercise, but perhaps the less, e the less easy exercise is to try to get some intuition, uh, to develop some, some intuition before you plot of how this function behaves as a, va as a, as a function of this parameter gamma, okay? And so uh, what you should do is try to understand what happens to this function as an increase or decrease gamma, okay? So try to do that before you just go and write the code, make a guess for yourself and say, okay, I think one corresponds to blue, two corresponds to whatever, um, and then write it down, then write your code and see what you get, okay? So I would encourage you to, to do that. Uh, and that will be, let's call that our first exercise. So go ahead and do that. If it's not clear, what I'm asking you to do, uh, send us a message and we try to clarify this um, in the next, you know, the last few minutes. And maybe the last thing that I'll say today is that um, let's imagine that um, instead what I'm giving you is I give you some experimental data associated with the distribution of events, just like we were seeing from this data associated with the Higgs. Um, we can see that the peak of, uh, there's a peak in the data, right? You can see that clearly. There's a little bit of a peak, right? There's a little bit of an enhancement. Um, 
And, and we would like to associate this peak with a mass of a particle and also associated with the particle to go through this decay process. And so essentially what we want to do is be able to say, okay, I want to fit this data using some, uh, a bright Wainer distribution and I want to be able to pick which values of M and gamma best describe this data. And so the question is, how do we do that actually in statistics? Or, well, how, how do we actually impose which values of M and gamma best describe this, um, this experimental data? Uh, and the answer is fitting. So we're going to be using fitting uh, to optimize the distance away, um, to minimize the distance away from our distribution and the actual experimental distribution as a function of the parameters of your distribution, namely n and gamma. And so that's what we're going to talk about next. Uh, and so perhaps let me say one word. Uh, and so just one last slide. So the, the fitting is, is the process by which we determine the values of the parameter that best the data, okay? Um, and so here you can see that here's some data that I've generated using some uh, values of M and gamma. I've, I've chosen this to be M of three and gamma of 0.5. And so the, these are these black points with error bars. Uh, I've generated some, some uh, semi-random errors. And so they're distributed along this way. And what you can see is that I can guess um, uh, in practice, try to guess what values of M and gamma correspond best. And you see that here M and gamma, I've chosen them to be 2 and 0.3, and they're really far away from the data. I've then dialed them to be 2.5 and 0.4, and it's getting a little bit closer. And then I, I chose a different values of 2.8 and 0.45, uh, and it's getting increasingly closer. Um, and so it seems like there's a trend here, right? If I dial these parameters wisely, I can be able to reproduce the behavior of the data. But what we want to do is make this more systematic. Okay. And so that's what we're going to pick up on starting on Thursday. So having said that, I think we're at a great point to stop and see um, if there are any pressing questions so far. Um, let me let the guys, uh, let the TAs see, you know, answer whatever questions you may have. But in the meantime, let me just remind you, the first thing that you can start doing is um, this exercise where you try to reproduce this plot using this function uh, and try to guess which values of gamma I've used. Raul. Yes, Juan. Yeah, we, uh, we have a question from Jeju Leo Cho from Chaji Taiwan, and it's related to the bright Wigner distribution. Yep. A, sorry, but can you guys clarify if M and gamma are whole constant or are we changing it? What about the energy and what is the goal of the exercise again? Sounds good. So, so here M and gamma are both going to be constants. The energy appears here. Okay. Um, and the, this is the only place that the energy lies. In general, gamma can depend on energy, and so that's one simplification that I made here. Uh, and so here, M and gamma are just going to be two parameters. Uh, and the goal so far is just for to get you to code function this function right here uh, and be able to reproduce these plots. Eventually, what we're going to do is play around with different uh, data analysis where I'm going to give you data, and then you're going to have to try to fit the parameters to your different functions to best reproduce the data. Uh, why am I picking this particular example where I'm using a bright Wigner distribution? Because it's very universal, it's very tight, it, it appears in many, uh, uh, in, in many analysis of experimental data in particle physics and nuclear physics, and so it's a universally important type of distribution. It depends on two parameters, so it's a non-trivial fit. Uh, you can't actually just you know, in general, guess it unless you have a very strong intuition of what M and gamma corresponds to. So you have to use uh, some non-trivial techniques like the ones that we're going to introduce. 
uh, but we're going to do other fits for simpler examples. Like we're going to fit to a single constant, um, not just a bright wave number, but also we're going to do a, a linear fit. Um, and so um, this is just one of the different examples that we're going to consider. Hopefully that answers the question. What do you think, Juan? Yeah. Yeah, I think that is a very complete answer. And anyway, the chat is open for more questions if needed or more clarification if, if some, more, some other person wants to. And there is another nice question. Let me, let me, Juan, let me, maybe add some more. I mean, these are, these are exercises. Uh, so this class, I think is, is kind of designed from exercises that um, I think perhaps Ted, but at least me, that I would definitely, um, are examples of exercises that I would expect my, my students to be able to reproduce if they wanted to work with me. And I think, you know, be able to do these kinds of fits of, uh, of data using these kinds of distributions, I think would be useful for, uh, anybody doing experimental analysis in, in, uh, in particle and nuclear physics. So that's where these are motivated. But they're, you know, they're loosely tied, you know, the, in this case is strongly tied to physics, but some of them that we'll consider are not always directly tied to physics. Go ahead, Juan. Yes, there is another question from uh, Nakul Sham, Sham Kumar. Sorry if I mispronounced the last name. Uh, from Chennai, India, and it's the following. Is fitting done just through a process of trial and error, or is it more sophisticated? You want to answer it? You want me to answer it? Uh, I, I, I mean, I can answer it. Um, yeah. We're not, we're not going to do fitting by trial and error. We're going to do fitting using routines that already exist in Python. In Python. So you can write your own, um, basically we're gonna use minimization and optimization routines. Um, you are always welcome and, and you, know, you should always try to write your own um, minimizers if you can, and at least have some intuitions of what the built-in ones do. Uh, but in this case, this is not a um, uh, computer science right here. We're going to be using what's already been built by uh, by computer scientists and other people that are love to to write code in, uh, for computational analysis. And what we're going to do is, is try to adopt these routines and build our uh, our our own right. So our own code for doing more specific analysis. So um, so we're going to use. It's not going to be by trial and error. It's going to be more sophisticated. But we are going to use built-in functions uh, within Python. Any other questions at this point? No others, and it is uh, 258, so it might be a good point to wrap it up. Sounds good, all right. Uh, so that's all we got for you today. So um, just to reiterate, go ahead and do this exercise. Um, write code for the Bright Wigner distribution. Here's an example of my code. Very simple. Now then try to reproduce this plot where what I'm plotting on the x-axis is energy. I perhaps didn't articulate that clearly enough. Um, so the x-axis is energy, okay? So try to reproduce this plot uh, and try to determine which values of gamma corresponds to which colors. Uh, and Thursday, we're gonna pick right back up here, trying to figure out, use a, uh, a function. We're gonna define a new function that is gonna be allows to, to give a systematic um, routine for us to best fit experimental data or data in general. Okay, so I think that's a great place to stop. So thank you everybody. Um, thanks again for joining.